Okay. Uh, chalo, let's not wait anymore. Enough, uh, enough of waiting. Because anyway, uh, those who are supposed to join, if they're late, uh, they, they can see the video. And why to make you people uh, get punished because of others' delay? Okay. Uh, one thing for sure, uh, bo both of you are my students. Uh, so uh, it's practically within us in-house uh, that, that a discussion is going on. I'm doing one thing. I'm I'm sharing the uh, screen here. Okay. So this is a paper this time, right? Acha, before I start with the paper, let me tell you a few things here. See, it's not possible that uh, all the 19 questions, uh, we know every year there, there will be 19 questions in the paper. 13 short notes, right? Uh, 19 questions are supposed to be answered. There are actually more than 19 questions. How? Uh, question number one and question number five, they would be having five, five, so 10 short notes. Then there, there would be six other questions, two, three, and four in section A, six, seven, eight in section B. All of these, they would be having two uh, long questions, two essay type questions of 20, 20 marks, right? So 12, uh, 20 markers there. And then there would be one short note there. So six short notes again. So total 16 short notes and 12 long questions, 28 questions in all. Now, it's obvious here, it's, it's not possible to discuss all the uh, 28 questions in one go. Why not possible? It will become too lengthy. It will require at least three to three and three to four hours of time, right? Let's not do that. So I'm, I'm not going to do that. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to be selective and I'm going to take up certain areas which we, at least I, if you ask me, I found to be a bit application oriented this time, right? Those questions which are pretty straightforward, I know. I know you people, right? Uh, we have been doing it in the class. I told you, okay, but they, as I promised you people, that more than 90% questions, they would be common from the class notes. You'll find the same thing here this time as well. Some of the questions, uh, they are more application based, especially the questions of research methodology, right? So I'm going to take up those questions. I'm going to look into those questions a little bit more, right? And obviously along with them, I'll, I'll also be looking at the other questions, especially the questions of the thinkers. Why not? Right. But uh, then again, let me be very honest here. I don't know whether you have gone through the question paper. Uh, Bharat sir must have had shared the question paper with you people uh, yesterday only, yesterday at night only. If you go through the question paper, exactly what I said in the class, I'll be repeating myself here again, right? Look at the questions. They can't go beyond what we did. I promised you that, and that still holds. That promise still holds. Right? I'm coming back to the discussion here. Starting with the first question only. Uh, I don't know whether you're being able to see this or not. Yes, sir. That's visible. Okay. See. It says, delimit the scope of sociology in relation to other social sciences. Okay, we can understand uh, what they're talking about. They're trying to understand the scope of sociology in terms of, uh, say, uh, if, if you remember the comparative analysis between sociology and other social sciences that we did, I said exactly where history ends in terms of com comprehensive understanding. That's exactly from where sociology starts. We have been discussing number of statements in the class. Uh, where history and sociology starts, or history without sociology is, uh, or sociology without history is rootless, history without sociology is fruitless. These kind of statements, uh, they have been previously asked by UPSC as well. We discussed those things in the class. At the same point of time, I also talked about uh, sociology and it's uh, real, the, the way sociology is compared with philosophy, then political science, economics, social anthropology, right? So in that sense, we have to talk about this particular question, this particular short note. Okay. Next, how does a researcher achieve objectivity in interpretive research? You can easily understand from where the question is coming, right? I am looking at uh, interpretive school of sociology and the focus of Weber there more on of value neutrality and through value neutrality towards achieving objectivity, right? 
and what are they talking about how are they how, how was weber suggesting us to achieve uh, objectivity through value neutrality he has been giving us certain methodologies ideal die versteyn right talk about those methodologies here don't name weber here guys please this question is not mentioning weber it's talking about interpretive research so we are going to use weber's methodology without mentioning weber here be careful about that so what i'm going to say that uh, as as we understand in interpretive research that the sociologist or the sociological researcher or the student of sociology should not be applying his or her mind why because he or she is value laden so if he or she the sociological researcher tries to apply himself or herself in in the understanding that understanding would be value laden so don't do that instead we should be going for methodologies like ideal type methodologies like versteyn in fact actual is versteyn the word that i mentioned there direct observational understanding right that was the exact term that was used by weber which has been taken up by talcott parsons when he was translating from uh, translating weber from german to english 1928 if you remember right so that's exactly what i would suggest here but be careful once again i'm repeating myself don't mention weber here without mentioning weber we are going to talk about the method that he suggested us clear why am i doing that the question is not mentioning weber the question is talking about interpretive research fine so let's do that in that sense now i'm coming to the next question question number 1c uh i'm sorry actually the paper i have got uh, the student of mine uh, he has written all over the paper i'm sorry for that but let's use this the difference between information and data in social science is subtle okay how to approach this see there is a difference between information and data i would be using a uh, one more wait a minute if you look at this di difference here what am i looking at as i see okay the key difference between data and information data is what it's a collection of facts while information when we talk about information information puts those facts into context into a perspective when we talk about sheer data that data is incomplete because it is not giving me any understanding on the other hand information is giving me an understanding while data is raw and un unorganized information is organized data points at individual data points are individual and sometimes unrelated information maps out that data to provide a big picture view of how it all fits together right data on its own is meaningless when it's analyzed and interpreted it becomes meaningful information so the basic idea is that data is not meaningful in that sense it's just raw in its in its form to make it meaningful i have to convert it into information so again i'm going back to the question here right the question says that difference between information and data in social science is subtle no it's not this difference is not subtle clear doesn't matter it has asked you to comment so what i would suggest you to do i would suggest you to point down the, this these 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 things these aspects that we should be writing down these points and then we should write down that no given these these differences we can understand that the difference between data and information even in social science is not so subtle but then be careful about one thing this question is asking us to comment while writing a comment i told you that the typical example of a comment is the editorial of the newspaper right the left hand side column on the hindus opaid page if you look at on the of, of the of the left hand side page the extreme left hand side column of the left hand side page uh those, those that long column there normally two pieces are written in paragraph format that's a typical comment so how are we supposed to write a comment in paragraph format 
never go point wise yes if if need be you can write firstly secondly thirdly you in that sense you can keep on writing right but one two three four or bullet marks no don't do that never ever do that you, because you're writing a comment right guys be careful about while you write the answers we need to properly follow the structure of the answers you do that you ensure that the presentation is proper and in accordance with the question right you will get marks and the target should always be to get at least half a mark or one mark more than the average joe say if i'm writing a 10 marker my target should always be to get at least 5.5 or 6. they would easily give me four or five if you write down these points the points that have uh, that that we normally discuss right if you write down these points they'll give you four four and a half or five easily very easily but that's not the target the target is to get that 5.5 or 6 which i've been so much stressing in the class if you remember that right let's come back next darkheim argued that society is more than the sum total of individual acts that's the very notion of Durkheim's positivism that's from where his positivism is coming right he's not ready to focus on the individuals he's he's always focusing on the collectivity the society according to his ideas society is sui generis if you remember that word right we use that word in the class now sui generis means which originates on its own or which maintains itself on its own and what is doing that for the society how how is it happening for the society with the help of social facts he says that the society is not made up of the individuals only yes the individuals are the constraints of the society but there is something more than the individuals the social facts right so i have to include that idea here that's the discussion here again this is about discussing here see the difference between comment and discuss discusses in case of discussing you can go point wise you have the liberty of using both paragraph format and point wise format doesn't matter but in case of comments be very careful no point wise writing here yeah. now how do sociologists construct gender in their analysis on social inequality right gender as we understand num number one this discussion is coming you can easily understand from from the feminist perspective right women studies uh what what we look at gender as as it is looked at gender is not a concept dependent on sex no it is not right in the discussion of gender in the construction of gender in sociology we look at the relationship of power with gender okay anyone who's not holding power who's not controlling power is feminist in gender is feminine in gender sorry right and anyone who is holding or yielding power is masculine in gender that's the difference between the two genders right in fact it is far more better understood if when when we are studying power the concept of power of weber and also the concept of power as talked about by parsons more than parsons it's it's about the concept of uh, power by weber the way Weber looked at the two two categories, say whether when while discussing class and party, right? The segment which which yields power is masculine, right? Those who impose their will over the others, the, the their, their capacity to impose their will over others, they are the masculines, and those on whom the will is imposed, they are the feminine. That's the construct of power. So if I look at power or if I look at gender in that sense, what do I see? not only women who are considered the feminine gender at the same point of time anyone who th their relationship with respect to power say children old age right they all should be considered as feminine gender anyone who's considered as a minority becomes feminine in gender right ordinarily speaking the idea of minority is numerically who are lesser in number 
that that's the idea minority in numbers but no in sociological constructs when we look at minority what we understand is those who lack power say in india if i have to understand the the uh, structure in india 8.3 percent of india's population they're scheduled tribes 16.4 percent they are scheduled castes around 30 percent to 35 percent of the population 35 percent around they are obc so practically 60 percent of india's population they are either obc sc or st right in spite of that they are the minority they are they are part of the feminine gender so while discussing sociological construct of gender always link it with power here yeah? that's where the difference lies and that's why we can easily understand this question here now that how do sociologists construct gender in their analysis on social inequality those who lack that power naturally they are excluded naturally they are discriminated against by those who yield power now and that's what exactly is inequality social inequality here yeah. so that's how to be looked at this particular question or this particular concept now what aspect of enlightenment do you think paved way for the emergence of sociology elaborate you do remember that discussion right emergence of sociology rise of modernity in europe and emergence of sociology right the way i talked about enlightenment the way i talked about rise of rationality post French Revolution, rise of uh, the, the right to ask questions, leading to rise of rationality, right? That rationality pooling enlightenment further. And from there, I'm looking at the rise of scientific temper, which would further supplement and fuel the industrial revolution in England. But let's not go up to that. Here, we should be focusing only on the role of enlightenment, how the right to ask questions is fooling enlightenment and within enlightenment i'm looking at the rise of rationality logic and scientific temper that discussion should should be here right sorry guys just a minute so that's how this this is to be discussed i hope we remember the discussion properly right now let's come back that's a very fast class normally what we can conduct right it's this question is typically from there now explain different types of non-probability sampling techniques bring out the conditions of their usages non-probability uh, techniques so you can easily understand uh, I'm, I'm not getting there right if you have gone through the, that material as well of research methodology you should have had come across this this is quite quite uh, straightforward now discuss social mobility in open and closed system right if you remember the discussion of uh, social mobility right uh that that i've talked about in uh, whether uh when what i mentioned even prithvim sorok in there right i'm talking i talked about uh vertical mobility within vertical mobility i talked about upward mobility and downward mobility right uh by while doing that we were talking about the open system and the closed system in the open system what happens things become far more accessible right things become far more uh let me show you the discussion here if possible mm. You will have previously also seen this particular uh, Hazana of mine, so not an issue. This one, right? In the open system, what do I see? I see that in the open system, open society, look at this statement here. Vertical mobility is intensive in relatively open societies. Sorokin has indicated the following general principles of vertical mobility. So. The principles are there, but in the open system, it's more intensive, if I may say, right? And if you remember in the class, we have properly discussed about vertical mobility. Within vertical mobility, I talked about the upward mobility, downward mobility, those aspects. I have talked about the rise of uh, so many billionaires in USA, say, uh, whether you talk about uh, uh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Tesla, uh, this uh, Elon Musk, right? We have been talking about these people in the class. And in comparison to that, I have been talking about the various uh, Indian industrialists, right? Uh, what do I see, whether the Ambani's or if I may talk about the Vipro, uh, Prem, Premji's or Billa's or Tata's, right? Over the generations, it's not in one generation that it, that it happened, right? So in that sense, I have to look at this, this development here. 
Clear? That's the that's the discussion between the open and closed system and mobility. In a closed system, if you remember, the uh, if, even at times the horizontal mobility becomes difficult. Why? Say, for example, caste system here in India. Now, even changing occupation within caste system becomes difficult. Someone who's born among the ironsmiths would remain to be ironsmiths, cannot take up, even if the person feels like, cannot take up carpentry. Right? So in that, in that sense, we should be looking at this discussion here. Uh, before I go further, because I've already discussed uh, question number one and question number two, to both of you, Ramya and Revant, uh, am I clear here, guys? Yes, sir. Okay, I also have someone else here. Right, Ramya. Uh, I don't have the... Uh, may I know the, person, the other person who's here with us? Anyway, uh, not, an, not an issue, but uh, I wish you have at least been able to understand what we are discussing here. Is the concept clear with you? Uh, why I'm asking you specifically, because uh, Ramya and Revant being my own students, I know what we have been doing in the class. So uh, in that sense, I have been talking about, but uh, I, I don't know about you. Uh, am I clear? Am I making any sense to you? That That's what I'm asking you. Anyway, I'm not getting any answer, so not an issue. Let's let's go forward. I'm coming to question number three A now. What are the shortfalls of positivist philosophy that gave rise to non-positivist methods of studying social reality? Right? Why in not why why we are seeing the non-positivist methodologies? Uh, they they're so critical of the positivist methodology. The very idea of non-positivist methodology say interactions perspective or interpretive sociology uh, symbolic interactionism why are they so critical of positivistic methodology no it's it's okay it's okay um, it's it's clear things are clear to you right that that's all that i'm Let's let's go forward. Okay, Vasilya. Uh, uh, things are clear to you, right? Uh, are, are you are you getting us what what we are discussing here? Are the concepts be, being clear to you? Okay. Okay. Now. This particular question, positivist philosophy that gave rise to non-positivist methodology. If you remember uh, the discussion for, for, for Revant and uh, for Ramya, the discussion that we uh, did about the major theoretical strands at that point of time, I talked about uh, positivist methodology first, then the functionalist school, then the conflict school, then we went for the interactionist school, then the symbolic interactionist school, right? Uh, in interaction school, the thinker was Max Weber. Symbolic interaction school, the thinker was George Herbert Mead, if you remember. right? At, and at that same point of time, I was also talking about how they were critical. That while the positive school, they were completely ignoring the individuals and predominantly focusing on the collectivity. Uh, Weber was of the opinion, both Weber and uh, Mead, they were of the opinion that no, the individuals, they also make sense. They are also significant. We cannot ignore them. Right? And as a result, in the discussions of Weber, we have seen Weber has been focusing both on individuals and on the collectivity. Say, for example, his discussion of uh, Verstehen, uh, the example of his discussion of Verstehen, that is uh, social actions theory, right? There we see uh, in Weber's social action theory, the way he has been focusing on the individual, the individual's understanding, Zweck rational, Wirt rational, traditional, 
and emotional, right? At the same point of time, Weber was also talking about uh, the collectivity uh, in Protestant school, uh, uh, the Protestant ethics and spirit of capitalism. He was talking about the collectivity. He was not focusing on the individual here. So in Weber's analysis or in uh, interactions perspective, I'm looking at the balance between both where Weber is giving due regards to the individuals as well. The meaning that is being attributed by the individual, the meaning to the social action being attributed by the social actor. Same thing I'm looking at in the discussion of George Herbert Mead, where he talks about the development of self and mind within the individual. His focus was completely individual and from individual's point of view, studying the society. That, that linkage was there in, in the discussion of George Herbert Mead, right? Why? If you remember, I shared uh, this, this particular uh, PDF with you people, right? Uh, positivism, positivism and its critic where these these points we talked about that uh i i talked about that how uh the non-positivist methodologies they they're critical say this thing let me read this in in uh a bit loudly for you the next points that i'm looking at those points would not be applicable here but this point would be applicable here First, it is possible to say that what is applicable in the domain of nature is not necessarily applicable in the domain of human society, because unlike nature, society consists of self-reflexive agents, human beings, who think, argue, contest, and through their practices and actions, transform the world. Hence, the society cannot be subject to abstract universal generalization. Positivism, it is alleged, undermines the creativity, reflexivity, and agency of social actors. We have seen that. When Emile Durkheim, he was talking about society being sui generis, and he was completely subjugating individuals to the collectivity. He was saying individuals are meaningless because they are, at the end of the day, guided by the social facts. Right? He was, he was actually undermining this aspect. So these are the points here. Here, we can easily divide this into two points. Point number one, up to here, right? And point number two, from here to here, right? This is that IGNU material that I shared with you people, if you remember. This one, positivism and its critic. Yeah. So that's how we should be looking at this, this particular aspect. Here. Yeah. Now, next, I'm coming back to the next question. And uh, why I discuss so many things here? Because this is at the end of the day, a 20 marker, 300 words answer. So guys, be clear, careful here. Here, yeah, this is not a short note. Now, uh, critically examine how Durkheim and Martin explicate anomie. If you remember, uh, this was uh, discussed in comparative analysis, okay. Uh, when we looked at anomie from the point of view of Durkheim, I'm looking at the similarity between uh, the understanding of anomie by Durkheim and by Martin. They both are considering anomie as normlessness or lawlessness. Point number one. Point number two, to both of them, anomie is a natural part of the society, even to Durkheim. See, Durkheim is a functionalist. In spite of that, he says that pathological social facts when he's talking about the types of social facts, he says pathological social facts in a limited quantity, they are functional to the society. So Durkheim there is accepting anomie as a form of pathological social fact in the society and is considering it to be a part of uh, norm normalcy. He's accepting that. So is Martin. Martin is also not negating the probability of anomie. He's saying it's, it's very much possible. It is going to be there. In his discussion of deviance, he's showing us that why, if you remember the discussion of deviance by, by Merton, right, the five forms, first four forms, then he also added, he revised the theory and added the fifth form, rebellion, right? So, con uh, conformist, uh, then uh, innovative, ritualism, retreatism, and then the fifth one that he added, rebellion, right? Uh, as a result of uh, the, the interaction between the two, two particular uh, social realities or uh, 
to particular aspects of the society, social control and uh, uh, sorry, why social control? The goal given by the, the culturally approved goals or the culturally accepted goals and the institutional means to achieve those goals, right? As a result of the interconnectedness between or, or the correlation between the two, that these probabilities being or these probabilities rising in the society. In that sense, we need to be looking at that theory of deviance. And from there, Martin is also normalizing anomie that this is bound to be there in society. Clear? Now, there ends the similarity. Okay. To Durkheim, anomie is an abnormal form of division of labor. Martin is not looking at anomie as an abnormal form of division of labor, division of labor because he is not looking at division of labor in that sense. To him, anomie is rising because of deviance, rise of deviance in society, because of the mismatch between the culturally accepted goals and the institutional means to achieve them, the deviance that's rising. And from there, I'm looking at the rise of anomie in society. Right? At the same point of time, if you if you look at anomie, the discussion of anomie in, in the discussion of Durkheim and in the discussion of Martin, Durkheim says that to, to Durkheim, anomie should be limited in sense. It should not be over expansive. If it becomes a uh, over expansive, it can can uh, stall the society. Martin is fearless here. Why? I'm looking at neo functionalism. I'm looking at even the concept of dysfunction. So Martin is quite fearless here. He's not bothered about the 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 limit of anomie in society. Yeah. So that's how we should be looking at the discussion between the two. Right. That's how they are explicating the idea of anomie. Next suggest measures to minimize the influence of researcher in the process of collecting data through focus group discussion. This is an application oriented question. When in the beginning I said that we'll be taking up the application oriented questions more and more. This is what I meant, right? Now, if I look at focus group approach, right? In the class, those among you who are my students, you have quite often than not seen me doing the focus group approach in the class. I've been asking you so many questions at the same point of time. We have been going for these exercises continuously. What happens in a focus group approach, the social researcher, he himself also himself or herself also becomes part of the focus group. The way I was also part of your focus group, quite often than not even I used to participate. I used to say what, what used to happen to me uh, or uh, my own experiences. I used to share those experiences with you people, right? That's a typical focus group approach. Now, there are certain problems in focus group approach. Number one, see the question. The question is not talking about the value neutrality or the value laden aspect of the researcher. Now, it says measure to minimize the influence of the researcher. So value is one of the aspects that the value of the researcher can influence the focus group. But on the other hand, the researcher can also mold the focus group. The researcher quite often than not gives a direction to the focus group's discussion. We need to be avoiding that. How to do that? Look at this discussion here. Right? In fact, if possible, I'll, I'll share this handbook of qualitative research, which I didn't do previously. Because, uh, you know, uh, I have always been saying, here, uh, let's be restrictive here. This is for the first time I'm, I'm seeing UPSC to trying to go in depth in research methodology a little bit. That's the only area where they have they have gone a little bit beyond this time. Okay, or else the questions, I don't think you should be finding the questions in any way difficult. Okay, let's come back. So in, in the focus group discussion, what I'm seeing two things here. Number one, it's preferable to go if, if you genuinely want the influence of the researcher to be less it's preferred to go unstructured, go, go for an unstructured uh, focus group approach, where the researcher himself is a passive participant at best. Let the discussion take its own direction. And then at the same point of time, we can also go for this Delphi technique. Right? Uh, in fact, to Ramya, I would say, Ramya or Revant, any of you, do remind me, I would like to share this particular PDF with you people if possible after the class, after this discussion. Um, it's, yes, sir. I'll... Right, this, this one. This is the Sage's handbook on, on uh, qualitative research. Okay. This particular handbook. You know the way I'm against buying books, right? 
why to buy books? That's, that's the primary concern here. So uh, just do remind me and I'll, I'll share this PDF with you. Yes. Sure. Now, let's come back. Because guys, let's be very honest. Quite often than not, these international books, they're very costly. Uh, quite a few books even I, uh, at times I feel that uh, it was, uh, I don't know whether it was right on my part to buy them or not. Uh, this this handbook only, it costs 12,000 rupees. Why to buy it here? No need, uh, because we just need only one aspect of it, right? Use it, not a, not a matter. Anyway, let's come back. Uh, the international edition of that book, yeah, it's really 12,000 rupees. I don't know about the Indian edition, but the international edition is 12,000 rupees, right? Now, next, uh, question number four. 4A. That was uh, question number three. We are done with that. I'm coming to question number four now. What characterizes degradation of work in capitalist society according to Marx? Degradation of work in capitalist society. Something because of which, now I'm not going to answer this. I need the answer from you people. I'm just giving you a cue here. Something because of which the worker is not feeling associated with the work. The work is not of the worker anymore. The worker does not know even the full process of the work. Which method? What is he talking about? Why is the work getting degraded? No, 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 not exploitation. Alienation. Yep, alienation. Alienation. Right? How come? The five stages of alienation. Alienation from the work, right? Dissociation from the work. Dissociation from the production process. Uh, production. Dissociation from the co-workers. Dissociation from the family. And finally, alienation from the self. So, so the, these these are the aspects that I'm looking at. That's how I'm looking at the degradation of work to happen happen in a capitalist society, because the worker is not feeling associated with the work anymore, na. Yeah. So that discussion discussion of alienation here. Yeah. Similarly, question number four B: Social stratification is claimed to contribute to the maintenance of social order and stability in society. Right, uh, Ganga, you're a present batch student, so uh, we have not started with social stratification yet. But to the other two, help me understand. I am looking at maintenance of an order, right? How come people are structured? People are structured in various layers, right? Whether you talk about the vertical layering of people or you talk about the horizontal layering of people, doesn't matter. Stratification can be vertical, stratification can be horizontal, if you remember that discussion carefully, right? Whatever it might be, but people are getting structured. The, the society is getting structured. Because the society is getting structured, the work process is getting divided. Everyone's individual aspect or role in the society is getting divided. And as a result, I'm looking at maintenance of the social order and stability in the society. Say the way caste system, today we know how, how bad caste system has been. But at the same point of time, we have also got to admit that the functionalists, they were right in certain aspect. When they said that the caste system at the end of the day was maintaining social order and stability. I'm looking at G.S. Ghure, if you remember. Right? Ghure, he looked at a caste system and he said that how caste system was integrating the society in the past. Now. So that way we should be looking at this discussion. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, please, 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 Revan. Not an issue, not an issue at all. See, sociology as a subject is not divided into paper one and paper two. UPSC, according to its requirement, has divided the subject into two papers. Right. Sociology is sociology. That is not divided into paper one and paper two. Na? So at ease, you can do that. 
Clear? Let's come back. Now I'm looking at what, what is reliability, explain the different tests, availability again, that research methodology, and this is quite straightforward. Okay, I'm coming to question number five. What am I seeing? Critically examine the relevance of Durkheim's view on religion in contemporary society. Okay. Achha. Uh one thing. This requires critical examination. For uh, Ganga, we have not done this yet. Uh, this this will come at the time of uh, comparative analysis. For Ramya and from Ravant, I I would be expecting the answer here. Uh, uh, Vatsalya, I uh, I'll help you out. Right. Achha, Let me discuss this with you. It's asking me to critically examine. While critically examining, I have to be a bit critical to the discussion, right? I have to look at the negative aspect here. So what's the negative aspect of the discussion of religion of, of Durkheim? What Durkheim is doing, please listen to me very carefully, guys. Durkheim tried to avoid complexities. In his efforts to avoid complexities, what he did, he didn't study religion in the modern complex society, in the, in the Parisian society that he was living in at the point of time. His idea was that since the nature of the society is complex, so complex would be the nature of the institution within the society called religion. In this condition, if he tries to understand the, the impact of religion in the society, his understandings might become erroneous. So he went for a simpler form of religion to study a simpler form of religion in a simpler society elementary form of religion elementary is not primitive elementary is not previous elementary means simple something which is very simple in nature right what did he do he went to study or he took the uh, book the golden boa written by sir james fraser from there he drew heavily and accordingly based on that discussion and others he studied the arunta tribe of australian aborigines right while studying the Arunta tribe and their totemic religion, he would form his theory. Now, look at the difference. This is also the difference. This is also the criticism of applying uh, the, the social anthropological understandings in sociology. So in social anthropology or in functionalism and even in positivism, here I'm looking at functionalism predominantly. And this is a criticism of functionalism given to us by Robert King Martin. Be careful, guys. Martin tells us that when we are taking these traditions from social anthropology, these social anthropologists, they study small societies, small homogeneous societies. So what is applicable in a small homogeneous society? How can you directly correlate that with a modern complex society? The modern complex society is heterogeneous. It's not homogeneous. These are the ideas which were used by Merton when he debunked the functionalist, na? the postulate of functional uh, un, un, uh, universal functionalism, functional unity, indispensability. He was debunking those ideas, those postulates. Why? Because he said that look at A. R. Cliff Brown, look at Brown, uh, Branislaw Manilowski, they are they are social anthropologists. That idea of social anthropology, if we directly bring that idea into sociology, sociology which is studying a modern complex society, which is heterogeneous in nature, it would always be erroneous. Now, as a result, when Durkheim was looking at the Arunta tribe of Australian Aborigines, a simpler society with a simpler form of religion, and he was looking at hope. In a modern complex society, I'm looking at religion to play a far more significant role. And not all of them are functional in nature. They are also dysfunctional in nature. How come? Because religion in a modern complex society is also giving rise to disintegration, disunity among people. It is not uniting people. It is uniting groups. The hom homogeneous groups are uniting. But the heterogeneous groups, they are getting away from each other. That too is happening. Now. At the same point of time, functional universal, uh, universal functionalism. 
no one particular religious idea might be universally functional to within one particular group that may not be functional to the other groups right so in that sense i'm looking at the critical aspect here criticism of durkheim from the point of view of martin as we understood uh, this part uh, even ganga in uh, in your class as well i have talked about this when i introduced martin in the class na yes sir yes sir so that's how yes, we should be going for this critical examination yes sir yes, sir yes, now discuss various theoretical perspectives of family theoretical perspectives of family exactly how the functionalists they look at family how the conflict theorists they look at family right how the symbolic interactions they look at family say for example this discussion which you all can see the screen here right what am i looking at here Just a moment, guys. Yeah. Functionalism, how they are looking at, at the things. Uh, conflict theory, how they are looking at things. Symbolic interactions, how they are looking at family. Those, th that discussion that will come here. The theoretical perspective on family. Okay. This is also pretty straightforward, guys, this question. Right. Next, explain the implication of feminization of work in developing societies. I have to look at both the aspects. It asks me to explain. Now, while explaining the implication of feminization of work, see uh, what I'm looking at. Number one, we have discussed this in details, both in uh, Indian society classes of GS and also in sociology classes, if you remember. Uh, in Indian society classes, I was talking about impact of globalization on Indian society. And uh, in that respect, I was talking about these things. See, number one, I'm looking at economic empowerment of women, the first and foremost thing within the developing societies. Number two, I'm looking at families, dual income families, where maybe the single income family was finding it difficult. Now, the dual income family for them to improve the standard of living would be better. The possibility to improve the standard of living would be far more better right so in that sense as well i'm i'm looking at it i know that economic empowerment at the end of the day gives rise to the other forms of empowerment that is social empowerment and political empowerment not the other way around as we have studied or as we have understood here in india if you remember again i'm going back to uh my discussions uh say role of uh, women in indian society Role of women and women's organization in Indian society in, in uh, GS classes, in sociology classes as well. I have been talking about this aspect uh, while talking about gender sens sensitization and other things, right? So, from that point of view, I'm looking at this discussion. Now, not only that, if that is happening, on the other hand, I'm keeping my discussion restricted here. Why? Because this is a short note. I have a limitation of 150 words. 150 words means once again uh, to Vatsalya as well and. Uh, Got guys, others, you know this this thing. Uh, do remember, see, we are not computers, right? We cannot write in 150 words exactly. So what do they mean by 150 words? Plus minus 10%. So in between 135 words to 165 words. That's my range. Same thing goes in case of 300 word answers, 20 markers. 270 words to 330 words. Plus minus 10%. That's the range for me. Yeah, and it's a good range. Within this, I have to keep it. Okay. So let's come back. So I'm looking at, on one hand, I'm looking at these positive impacts. Number one, economic empowerment of women. Number two, economic empowerment giving rise to other forms of empowerments, right? Women finding a position, a foothold in the society, uh, becoming a part of the decision making process, right? At the same point in time, I'm looking at an uh, increase in standard of living in the society, right? Uh, average household earnings increasing. Right, those aspects as well. I'm looking at uh, productivity increases. Right. On the other hand, I'm also seeing that in a developing society, please try and understand the availability of job is restricted. So when women also join the workforce, what happens? The competition for the job increases. Now this has both 
a good impact as well as a bad impact. Why bad impact? Because the competition for the job is increasing, the employers can bargain. The employers can bargain and they can reduce the payment for the job. So we do also see a reduction in pay scale. Just imagine, this is seriously unique here. 2004, during my time, during my days, the entry level salary in the software sector, in the IT sector, was 26,000 rupees. Okay. After 18 years, 18 years, guys, not one year, not two years, 18 years, 2022, the entry level salary in the software sector is varying between 25,500 rupees to 29,000 rupees. Right. And why did this happen? Because an increased availability of the workforce. I'm not focusing only on feminization of work. Now, I'm looking at an increased availability of the workforce. Yeah, but that that too is an impact of the feminization of work, no doubt about it. At the same point of time, I'm also looking at the uh, castigation in the form of glass ceiling effect, commodification of uh, women, or or more than commodification of women, pink colorization of jobs that I'm I'm talking about. I'm looking at that pink colorization of job, glass ceiling effect. Those things I'm also looking at in terms of feminization of work. Yeah. So both the positive aspects and the negative aspects. Be careful about them. Write a note on global trend of secularization. Right. Uh, we know what is secularization. The two forms of secularization: Western form of secularization, Indian form of secularization. But this discussion is not about that. In the recent times, if you have carefully seen. Somewhere, somehow, I'm looking at the rise of the far right. In Italy, the, the person who's, who's set to become the Prime Minister of Italy, the lady, she is known to be extreme far right. Some 19 years back, she had even praised Mussolini, Benito Mussolini, the fascist ruler of Italy. The person who was one of the key aspects of the Second World War. Right. On the other hand, even in Sweden, see, normally the Nordic countries, they, they are considered to be uh, extremely well in terms of social parameters and very open societies. Even in one of those Nordic countries called Sweden, I'm looking at rise of the far right. The person who has come to power in Sweden is a far right person, is a right winger. The more I'm looking at, conflicts rising in the society. The more I'm looking at conflicts rising at various corners, whether Syria or Palestine or the Middle East or Afghanistan, the more influx of refugees as I'm looking at. With that influx of refugees, I'm looking at an, a form of identity crisis. And at the same point of time, I'm looking at rise of the right. And there, in that aspect, I'm looking at secularization here. So this is a question typically based on application. I told you, I warned you in the class. Be careful. Be careful about this application. That's what exactly I'm looking at here. Clear? Chalo. So don't approach this question only from the point of view of secularization. No, it's not what, what we are thinking here. That's not how, how the things are. Clear? Chalo. Let's come back. Praise the trajectory of a development perspective on social change. Again, a pretty straightforward question. Here. Yeah. Development perspective on social change. Obviously, I'm looking at the vertical mobility and that to upward mobility. I'm also looking at some forms of uh, uh, horizontal mobility, but mostly I'm looking at upward mobility. And uh, in that sense, I'm, I'm looking at this discussion, right? Because it, it talks about the trajectory, trajectory of development perspective on social, social change, right? Chalo. The next questions I found them to be pretty, pretty straightforward. Say the question of a uh, need. According to me, the idea of self uh, develops when the individual becomes self-conscious. If you remember, uh, 
those among you uh, who are my students and we have talked we have already studied mead for those uh, ganga we have not studied mead yet um say when 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 we were talking about uh, uh the development of self and mind and i told you that self and mind they cannot develop in a vacuum in a social vacuum yes once the self and mind they have developed if the person goes to live in a vacuum the person can live there but for the self and mind to develop you need social interaction and also the dialectical relationship between self and mind right here by self consciousness i'm looking at the development of mind here and that dialectical relationship that that me is talking about here yeah uh analyze the nature of a transition from ideology to ident identity politics in india okay yeah i am uh, looking at a uh, rise of regionalism uh rise of uh, uh religious identity based politics so many so so many other aspects right so that that's a discussion here yeah now uh six c uh, little tradition great tradition again pretty straightforward uh, critically analyze Parsons view on society as a social system. Right. Even this, you should be able to. Uh, these are all mostly these are straightforward questions. So I'm not getting any further here. Right. Now I'm opening the uh, discussion for you, you people. Uh, any doubt that you have, uh, because you have all, I hope you have already gone through the previous the, the this year's paper. So any confusion that you have, if you if you have those those confusions, do ask me. Should those questions. Sir, uh, in the first question, you said that uh, don't mention uh, thinker's name. Yeah. Um, and not at all. I think it was a second question. A second question or first question? I don't remember exactly. Uh, question D. Uh, question 1B. One B. One B. One B. One B. How does a researcher achieve objectivity in interpretive research? Why I said so? Because the question is being asked from the point of view of interpretive school of sociology. I'm not mentioning Max Weber here. Though the idea is of Max Weber. But the question is asking me, you are river. No doubt. But the question is saying, what is this idea? Say so you give me one idea. You're saying, what is this idea? Here, because of the limitation of words, let's avoid mentioning Weber. Yeah. Rather, let's just focus on the discussion, the predominant discussion. That's what I, I would prefer to say. Okay, okay. okay. Anything else, guys? Vasilya? Yes, sir. Sir, how could we address the word contemporary society? Like, how do we mention while writing answer? See, contemporary society, the moment we are talking about, we are looking at uh, the, the modern society, the modern complex society, which is being studied by sociology. Right. So it's not by contemporary society. I'm not just meaning India right now. I'm looking at any heterogeneous complex society. That's the contemporary society to me. Clear? Okay, sir. Say, for example, when I was talking about, if you if you remember, when I was critically analyzing uh, the uh, religion of Durkheim, to me, the contemporary society was Paris in 1912. No? Yes, sir. So when I'm talking about the contemporary society, I'm not just meaning the present society. I'm meaning any modern heterogeneous society modern complex heterogeneous society okay that's the feature now what is a modern society any society which has started to think rationally which has started to think logically with the rise of rationality with the rise of logic i'm looking at rise of modernity those are the very essential features for rise of modernity so any society which has started thinking rationally which has started thinking logically that's a modern society wow. Clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. In fact, this is uh, for not just for Vatsalya, for everyone. Uh, 
that's exactly from where I'm, I'm, we are looking at rise of uh, sociology now. Rise of modernity in Europe and emergence of sociology. From there, I'm, I'm looking at this idea of contemporary social society. Yeah. Sure. Anything else, guys? Ganga, Ramya. I said, said good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, um, so thank you so much, sir. Actually, it helped me so much to understand many things. As I'm new to social media, I try to connect the things. Sir, yeah. Uh, see, for you, uh, since uh, this is the beginning of the of the classes now, so for you, yes, you would still find some of the areas a bit critical, right? Yes, sir. yes, sir. But at least those questions. Uh, for the area of which we have already discussed in the class. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Those say, questions say, I say, very say, 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 pass yes, sir. Let's let me be very honest here. UPSC has a limitation. They can't go beyond certain perspectives. Yes. That's why so confidently I could say in the class that guys, I know to what extent they can they can go. But at the same point of time, I also warned you people about about certain aspects. The application part. We saw one application part, na. No? one three four questions from application yes. that would be there that too yes, sir. really sir. Yes, sir. You know, we are feeling like you know so much complicated sure. thank you so much sir. thank you ramia uh, thank you sir for your question any problem Yes, sir, I have a doubt uh, yeah. regarding the question. Suggest measures to minimize the influence of researcher in the process of collecting data. The application oriented one. In, in a focus group, right? In a focus. Yeah, group. yeah. You have uh, you have said that uh, Delphi technique, right, sir? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, do we have any other measures sir, for that? Uh, the first and foremost thing that I I suggested you. If you remember, we used to do uh, focus group discussions in, in the class. Na? I used to give you a topic or, or I used to raise a question in the class. Then I, I used to ask you people keep uh, what's going on. You tell me, you give your perspective. I, I used to also be, a, be actively part there, right? That was a typical focus group approach that we used to do in the class. Now, in the focus group approach, what happens? The researcher tries to mold the discussion of focus group according to his or her comfortability or the direction he or she wants to take it to. Though the researcher might be objective, I'm assuming the researcher is objective here, the, the value of the research is not influencing. Also, that, that too is a possibility. That's why it should be avoided. But let me assume the researcher is very objective here. Even then, I do see a very heavy presence of the researcher here. And this question says, can we minimize that? Yes, it, it is possible to minimize it. Say, number one, if uh, if uh, the researcher becomes passively participant, not an active participant, the researcher raises the topic and then allows the group to discuss. He or she is just sitting down and listening to them and observing them. That's it. Point number one. Number two, instead of are creating a large focus group if the researcher creates small small nominal groups the term is nominal groups say instead of a group of 40 people or 50 people if i create say five five people group of five people say four or five groups of five people each and their discussion from from that i'm drawing my data right while being passive and then comes the Delphi technique. So all of these measures at the end of the day, they can help me reduce the influence of the researcher in the discussion process, in the focus group discussion, or else because see, since the researcher is directly involved in the, in the focus group discussion, there is a possibility that the researcher knowingly or unknowingly would start influencing it. How many times has it has did it happen that while talking to you people, while discussing in the class, mm -hmm. I unknowingly, I unwittingly influenced your thought process? It happened so many times. Yes. Now that was my job as a teacher in the class mm -hmm. to give you the perspectives. Right. 
but in a research group my influence should be minimal because i'm trying to draw the data from there if my influence becomes heavy that's already my preconceived notion that i'm i'm, I'm justifying there through the through the focus group the data is not impartial the data is becoming partial no so that's why the influence needs to be reduced at times in the focus group approach okay Yes. Yeah, okay. 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 Sure. Yes, Raven. That's exactly what what used to happen. I I know I used to influence uh, things there, which is not done. But now in the class I had an obligation because I, I was also your teacher, so I used to discuss with you and I also I used to also give my perspective and then used to get that perspective from me. But that was a way of influencing. That that's influ creating influence here, which is not right. The sociological research should be avoiding doing that. Sure. Sure. That's all, guys. So I'm ending the discussion here. So yeah, yeah, yeah that long, uh, You said that uh, remember him. Right, right, right. That, that thing. Uh, one thing what I'll do, uh, since uh, see, I can communicate with uh, with the three of you, but I can't communicate with Vasat Vatsalya. So what I'll do, uh, I'll I'll give it to Bharat sir right okay. along with this video so it, it will be the job of bharat sir uh not only that that particular uh what to say uh that that pdf oh, uh, and also uh, say say uh, wait a minute uh, let me show you i had also shared the, the this thing i have also shown you this thing right i've also uh, wait a minute where where is it yeah this, this particular answer right so I've shared these, these, shown you these answers as well. So I'll share them with Bharat as well, uh, Bharat sir. So Bharat sir will share all of these things with you people. That that okay. PDF plus these two answers. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sir. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for being so patient. Right. <laughs> Shall. <laughs> Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you sir. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. All the best. Bye. Sir.